Hey family, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right, so we're reading the soon deck though. And guess what? We're in the section that says the Battle of Badr, the first decisive battle in the history of Islam. And then it says reason of the battle. We're getting in, we're getting in. We have already spoken about Al-Ushara invasion when a caravan belonging to the Quraysh escaped an imminent military encounter. When the Prophet, peace be with him, and his men, when their return from Syria approached, the Prophet, peace be with him, dispatched Talha bin Ubaidullah and Said bin Zaid northward to scout around for any movements of this sort. The two scouts stayed at al Haura some days until Abu Sufyan, the leader of the caravan, passed by them. The two men hurried back to Medina and reported their findings to the Prophet, peace be with him. Great wealth amounting to 50,000 gold dinars, guarded by 40 men, moving relatively close to Medina, constituted a tempting target for the Muslim military and provided a potentially heavy economic, political, and military strike that was bound to shake the entire structure of the Meccan polytheists. Wow, 50,000 dinars. Boy, that's a lot of money. The Prophet, peace be with him, immediately encouraged the Muslims to rush out and intercept the caravan to make up for their property and wealth. He did not give orders binding to everyone, but rather gave them full liberty to go out or stay back thinking that it would be just a task on small scale. Ah, wow, so this was a Northward Scout. Wow, 50 gold. Wow. That's amazing. The size and strength of the Muslim army. The Muslim army was made up of 300 to 317 men, 82 to 86 immigrants and 61 men from the Aus and 170 from the Khazraj tribes. So we have the immigrants, we have uh, the Khazraj, the Aus. They were not well equipped nor adequately prepared. They had only two horses belonging to Az Zubair bin al Awam and al Mikhadad bin al-Aswad al-Kindi, 70 camels, one for two or three men to ride alternatively, Allah's messenger, peace be with him himself, Ali and Marthad bin Abi Marthad al-Gahnawi had only one camel, administered to Ibn Um Maktoum, but later to Abu Lubaba, been Abdul no Abdul Mundir. The head flag was given to Musa bin Umair al Qureshi al Abdari, and their standard was white in color. The little army was divided into two battalions. Okay, two battalions. The immigrants with a standard raised by Ali bin Abi Talib and the helpers whose standard was in the hand of Sa'ad bin Mu'ad as Zubair bin al-Awam, was appointed to the leadership of the right flank, al miqdad bin Amr to lead the left flank. And the rear of the army was at the command of Qais bin Abi Sasa. The general commander in chief was the prophet, peace be upon him, of course. Oh, it tells you everybody who's leading what? Next paragraph says the Muslim army moves near Badr. Get into the battle zone! You know I like battle stories. The prophet, peace be upon him, at the head of his army, marched out along the main road leading to Mecca. He then turned left towards Badr, and when he reached Asafra, he dispatched Bas Bas bin Amr al Juhani and Abi Az Zakba al Juhani. That's a cool sounding name. Wow, that's a really cool sounding name. 
to scout about for the camels of the Quraysh. Next paragraph says, Warning in Mecca. Abu Sufyan, on the other hand, was on the utmost alert. He had already been aware that the route he was following was full of dangers. He was also aware of the movements of Muhammad, peace be with him. His scouting men submitted reports to the effect that the Muslims were lying in ambush for his caravan. To be on the safe side, he hired Damdam bin Amr al Gifari to communicate a message asking for help from the Kurishites. Wow, okay, so Abu Sufyan, right? Okay, and then that guy hired Damdam, okay, to be an emissary, sort of. Dismounting his camel, he stood dramatically before the Kaaba, cut off the nose and the ears of the camel, uh, turned its saddle upside down, tore off his own shirt from front and behind, and cried, O Quraysh, your merchandise, it is with Abu Sufyan. The caravan is being intercepted by Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his companions. I cannot say what would have happened to them. Help, help. Why he gotta mutilate the camel? The camel didn't do anything. Maybe to get attention, right? Okay, the next paragraph says, The people of Mecca hasten for battle. The effect of this hue and cry was instantaneous, and the news stunned the Quraysh, and they immediately remembered their pride that was wounded when the Muslims had intercepted the Hadrami caravan. They therefore swiftly gathered almost all of their forces, and none stayed behind except Abu Lahab, who delegated someone who owed him some money. They also mobilized some Arab tribes to communicate to the war against the Prophet, peace be upon him. All the clans of Quraysh gave their consent except me. Wow. Bulahab, Qais bin Abi Sasa. Interesting. Preparing the Meccan army. Soon an excited group of 1300 including 100 horsemen, that's a decent cavalry, and 600 soldiers in male armor with a large number of camels were shouting to proceed to fight the Muslims. Oh! Oh, wow! That's a lot of cavalry for the Muslims to fight. For supplies, they would slaughter an alternative number of camels of 10 and 9 every day. Next paragraph says, The Problem of Banu Bakr. They were, however, afraid that Banu Bakr, on account of an old, long, deep-seated hostility, would attack their rear. At that critical moment, Iblis, Satan, appeared to them in the guise of Suraka bin Malik bin Jusham al-Mudliji, chief of Bani Kinana. Wait a minute. It's contending that Satan... Uh, disguised himself as this person who was a chief. Oh, wow. Saying to them, I guarantee that no harm will happen from behind. Next paragraph says, The army of Mecca begins its movement. They set out burning with anger, motivated by a horrible desire for revenge and exterminating anyone that might put in danger the routes of their caravans. Boastfully, and to be seen of men, and hinder men from the path of Allah. Or as the Prophet said, O oh Allah, these are the proud and arrogant. They have come to fight Allah and to fight his messenger. And they went in the morning with strong intention, thinking that they have power. They moved swiftly northward to Badr, passing the valley of Usfan, Kadid, then al Juhafa. Here they received another message from Abu Sufyan asking them to go back home because the caravan had escaped the Muslims. Wow. A caravan carrying that much gold is a huge risk. It's a lot of gold, baby. The caravan escapes. Incidentally, Abu Sufyan, on learning the intention of the Muslims, 
led his caravan off the main route and headed towards the Red Sea. By this move, he was able to slip past the Madanese ambush and was out of their reach. The Meccan army considers returning. On receiving Abu Sufyan's message, the Meccan army showed a desire to return home. The tyrant Abu Jahal, however, proudly and arrogantly insisted that they proceed to Badr, stay three nights for making festivities. Now they wanted to punish the Muslims and prevent them from intercepting their caravans and impress on the Arabs that the Quraysh still had the upper hand and enjoyed supremacy in that area. In spite of Abu Jahal's threats and insistence, Banu Zahra, acting in the advice of the al aknas whoa, Bin Shuraik broke away and returned to Mecca. Thenceforth, al aknas remained the well-rubbed palm tree for Bani Zahra and was blindly obeyed in all relevant matters. Banu Hashim were also inclined to break away, but Abu Jahal up that idea. The rest of the army now, a thousand soldiers, approached Badr and encamped themselves beyond a sand dune at al Udwatul Kuswa. The difficult position of the The intelligence corps of the Madanese armies reported to the Prophet, peace be with him, that a bloody encounter with the Meccans was inescapable and that a daring step in this context had to be taken, or else the forces of evil would violate the inviolable and would consequently manage to undermine the noble cause of Islam and tread upon its faithful believers. The Muslims were afraid that the pagan Meccans would march on and start the war activities within the headquarters of Islam. Oh yeah, you know, so beat them on, like, on a territory far away. Don't let them start the battle. That nature certainly damage and produce an infamous impact on the dignity and position of the Muslims. A meeting for consultation. On account of the new grave developments, the Prophet, peace be with him, held an advisory military emergence meeting to review the ongoing situation and exchange viewpoints with the army leaders. That's pretty cool. It'd be cool to be a fly on the wall, hear what they're talking about. How are you going to prepare for battle 1,400 years ago? It's very different than the way you prepare now. Similar, but different. Would have been very cool to listen in on this conversation. Encounter and their courage began to waver. In this regard, Allah says, Has your Lord caused you, O Muhammad, to go out from your home with the truth and verily and partly, no, a party among the believers disliked it, disputing with you concerning the truth after it was made manifest, as if they were being driven to death while they were looking at it. The Prophet, peace be upon him, apprised his men of the gravity of the situation and asked for their advice. Abu Bakr was the first who spoke and assured the Prophet of the unreserved obedience to his command. Umar was the next. Then, okay, Umar. Then, al Mikdad bin Amr got up and said, O Messenger of Allah, proceed where Allah directs you to, for we are with you. We will not say, as the children of Israel said to Moses, Go you and your Lord and fight, and we will stay here. Rather, we shall say, Go you and your Lord and fight, and we will fight along with you. I don't one for all and all for one. By Allah, if you were to take us to Burk al Gihmad, we will still fight resolutely with you against its defenders until you gained it. Fight until the, until the end. The Prophet then spoke well to him and supplicated for him. The three leaders who spoke were from the emigrants. Oh who only constituted a minor section of the army. 
the prophet peace be with him wanted and for the more reason to hear the helpers view because they were the majority of the soldiers and were expected to shoulder the burden of war activities ah yeah you gotta make them say like get the mood of that camp right moreover the clauses of al akba pledge did not The Prophet, peace be with him, then said, O oh, people, advise me. That's a good leader. Listening to counsel instead of just bullhorning in and doing what you want to do. The commander listening to like, okay, what do you say? What do you think? It makes sense. By which he meant the particular upon this, Said bin Muad stood up and said, By Allah, I feel you want us, the helpers, to speak. The Prophet directly said, Oh yes. Sa'ad said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, we believe in you and we bear witness to what you have granted to us. And we declare in clear terms that what you have brought is the truth. Declared in clear terms. I noticed something. Some people with rhetoric, they play trickery games, right? Uh, Rumpelstiltskin is an old myth where uh, you talk to somebody and then they trick you. And then because of the trickery of their words, they get you to do something you don't want to do. With the Muslims, I'm noticing it's the complete opposite. They're proud to tell you clear terms. They're not trying to play word trickery games. That's very interesting because all the Islamic texts that I read, they're very proud and really want to make it known. No, no, no. Works to clear and open terms, clearness, spoken in a clear manner. There isn't this lawyer talk of trickery of language, right? It tells you a lot. It's, I really like that. That what you have brought is the truth. We give you our firm pledge of obedience and sacrifice. We will obey you most willingly in whatever you command us. And by Allah, who has sent you with the truth? If you were to ask us, we will do that most readily. And not a man of us will stay behind. We do not deny the idea of an encounter with the enemy. We are experienced in war and we are trustworthy in combat. Yeah, when you say you're trustworthy in combat, uh, that's worthy. They, they flip sides. Machiavelli had a very good point about mercenaries. Those you hire to work for you, if they're not truly dedicated to your cause and they're only working for gold, man, they can flip the script real fast. So notice how these soldiers are saying, like, no, 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 we're down. Like, we're ready. Like, let's do this. Tells you a lot. They're not asking, pay us the coin first, and then we fight. They're like, no, we're with you. We hope that Allah will show you through our hands those deeds of bravery which will please your eyes. Kindly lead us to the battlefield in the name of Allah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was impressed with the loyalty and the spirit of sacrifice which his companion showed at this critical point. Then he said to them, Move ahead and receive good news. For Allah has promised me one of the two, the rewarding course through capturing the booty of strife in the cause of Allah against the polytheist. And by Allah, it is as if I know... No, no, now. And by Allah, it is as if I now saw the enemy lying prostrate. Oh. Huh. The messenger... And the survey of the enemy. In the immediate vicinity of Badr, the Prophet, peace be with him, and his companion Abu Bakr conducted a scouting operation during which they managed to locate the camp of the Quraysh. Look at that. Muhammad and Abu Bakr, some of the most important people in the military campaign, went themselves to scout. A lot of leaders. They're like, no, 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 we'll stay in the tent. Send out the scouts yourself. Notice how he's taking an active role 
in the not just is in hearing out the soldiers, but participating not just in the fighting in the organization and the allocation of resources and the strategic approach. He's also doing part of the scouting himself. That's pretty brilliant. They came across an old Boudin, Boudin nearby whom they managed skillfully to extract the exact location of the army of the polytheists. In the evening of the same day, he dispatched three emigrant leaders. Okay, three immigrant leaders. Abi Talib, Az Zubair bin Al Awam, and Said bin Abi Waqas, to scout about for news about the enemy. They saw two men drawing water for the Meccan army, so they brought them back with them. Upon interrogation, they admitted they were water carriers working for Quraysh. That answer did not please some of the Muslims, and they beat the two boys severely in order to extract from them an answer. A pretty common tactic in military. Pretty common. Even if it isn't true, referring to the caravan laden with wealth, the two boys thus lied, and so they were released. The Prophet, peace be upon him, who had been busy in prayer, was angry with those men and censored them, saying, On telling the truth, you beat them. And on the telling a lie, you release them. By Allah, the truth is that they were from the Quraysh. Uh-oh, somebody got busted. He then addressed the two boys, and after a little conversation with them, he learned a lot about the enemy. The number of soldiers, their exact location, and the names of some of their notables. Oh, he must have had a very good persuasive argument. He then turned to the Muslims and said, this is Mecca, sending to you its most precious lives. The next paragraph says, The Rainfall. The same night, it rained on both sides, for the polytheists, whereas it was a blessing for the Muslims. It cleaned them and removed from them the stain of Satan. Allah sent rain to strengthen their hearts and to plant their feet firmly therewith. Rain battle scenes are pretty cool in cinematography. It is pretty cold, though. I wonder what the rain does in the desert, though. Because if your horses get in the rain, it, they get stuck in the mud. But they had camels and sand. How rain behaves on sand. It's a go down, and it just makes the sand more firm and compact, kind of like when you build a sand castle. I wonder what that would have been like. And I wonder if they had what type of armor they had. Because the rain can damage the make your metal rust. I wonder what kind of what they did to prevent rust if they had a lot of metal. Be very cool to look up what the armor what what their military uniform looked like at that time. Interesting. Next paragraph. The Muslim army marches ahead. They marched a little forward and encamped at the farther bank of the valley. Muhammad, peace be with him, stopped at the nearest spring of Badr. Al-Hubab bin Mun asked him, Has Allah inspired you to choose this very spot, or is it strategy of war and the product of consultation? The Prophet, peace be with him, replied, It is strategy of war and consultation. Al-Hubab said, This place is no good. Let us go and encamp at the nearest water well and make a basin or reservoir full of water. Then destroy all other wells so that they will be deprived of the water. The Prophet, peace be upon him, approved of his plan and agreed to carry it out, which they actually did at midnight. Controlling the resources so that the water well, because that's where you could water your camels, right? Preparing the trellis for the headquarters. Sa'id bin Mu'ad suggested that a trellis be built for the Prophet to function as headquarters for the Muslim army and a place providing reasonable protection for the leader. Sa'id began to justify his proposal and said that if they had been victorious, then everything would be satisfactory in case of defeat. The Prophet, peace be with him, would not be harmed, and he 
Medina, where there were more people who loved him and would have come for help if they had known that he was in that difficult situation, so that he would resume his job, hold counsel with them, and they would strive in the cause of Allah with him again and again. A squad of guards was also chosen from among the helpers under the leadership of the same man, Sa'id bin Mu'ad, in order to defend the Prophet in his headquarters. Allah's Messenger, peace be with him, planned the positions of his army, walking throughout the place of the planned confrontation, pointing with his hand, saying, This is the position of so-and-so tomorrow, if Allah wills, and this is the position of so-and-so, if Allah wills. He, that's like God willing, right? The Prophet, peace be upon him, then spent the whole night in prayer near a tree. The Muslim army, Tired from their long march, enjoyed sound and refreshing sleep, a mark of the divine favor and of the state of their undisturbed minds. Yeah, it's hard to sleep, you know, when you're getting ready for battle, man, that adrenaline that they must have been feeling, but they were able to get some rest, which is good. Remember when he covered you with a slumber as a security from him, and he caused rain to descend on you from the sky? to clean you thereby and to remove from you the whispering evil suggestions. Look, map of Badr invasion. Let's see if you can see it. Probably is not too clear, but you can still see some of it. Uh, suggestions of Satan. And to strengthen your hearts and make your feet firm thereby. That was the night preceding Friday Ramadan, 17th the year 2 A.H., and they had originally left for battle on the 8th or the 12th. Positioning of the Meccan army. The Quraysh, on the other hand, positioned their forces at Al-Udwatul Huswa. Oh, all right, they get into that. Where they put opposite the Muslim lines. A few of them approached, in a provocative deed, to draw water from the wells of Badr, but were all shot dead except one. Hakim bin Hizam, who later became a devoted Muslim, Umar bin Wahab al-Jumahi, in an attempt to explore the power of the Muslims, made a survey and submitted a report saying that the Muslim army numbered as many as 300 men Keen on fighting to the last man. Hey, look at that. Instead of the 300 Spartans, you get the 300 Muslims. On another investigation mission, he came to the conclusion that neither more force was coming nor ambushes laid. He understood that they were too brave to surrender and too intent on carrying out their military duties to withdraw without slaying the largest number possible of the polytheists. This report, as well as kindred relations binding the two confronting parties together, lessened the desire to fight among some of the Kurishites. To counteract this reason-based opposition advocated by a rival of his, Utba bin Rabia and others, Abu Jahal started an anti-campaign seeking revenge on Muhammad's followers for the Kurishites killed at Nakla. In this way, he managed to ruin the opposite orientation, manipulated the people to see his evil views only. Interesting. So Abu Jahal, he wants revenge for the Kurishite people who were killed at Nakla. Oh, the two armies meet. Oh, here we go. When the two parties approached closer and were visible to each other, the Prophet, peace be with him, began supplicating to Allah. The proud and arrogant Kurishites are already here rebelling against you and belying your messenger. O oh Allah, I am waiting for your victory, which you have promised me. I beg you, Allah, to defeat them, the enemies. He also gave strict orders that his men would not start fighting until he gave them his final word. Exactly. Hold the line. Nook when you got a nook. Don't do it unless it's time to go, right? 
He recommended that they use their arrows carefully and never resort to sword unless the enemies came very close. Oh, yeah! <laughs> the archers, yes. Abu Jahal also prayed for victory, saying, Our Lord, whichever of the two parties was less kind to his relatives and brought us what we do not know, then destroy him tomorrow. They were confident that their superior number, equipment, and experience would be decisive. Allah revealed, O oh, disbelievers, if you ask for a judgment, now has the judgment come unto you, and if you cease to do wrong, it will be better for you, and if you return to the attack, so shall we return, and your forces will be of no avail to you, however numerous it be, and verily Allah is with the believers. 8.19 The first clash The first disbeliever to start the fire of the battle and be its first victim was Al-Aswad bin Abdul Asad al-Maksumi a fierce, bad temper idolater. He stepped out swearing he would drink from the water basin of the Muslims, otherwise destroy it or die for it. He engaged with Hamza bin Abdul Mutalib, who struck his leg, finish him off inside the basin. Oh, I wonder if he did on the lower leg or on the thigh, like to get the calf. Or the ankle, the knee, or the thigh. Be very cool to know. And if he came like from the left and hit the right, or if he came from the right and hit the left, and what kind of sword he used. Oh, I wonder, what was it called? The dueling begins. The battle had actually started, protected by armor and shields. Okay, so they did have, like, the armor shield. Utbah bin Rabia stepped forth between his brother Shaiba and his son Al-Walid bin Utbah. Whoa, okay, we got these names. The lines of the Quraysh encursed the Muslims. Three young men of the helpers came out against them. Auf and Muawid the sons of Harith and Abdullah bin Rahaha, but the Meccans shouted that they had nothing to do with them. They wanted the heads of their cousins. Upon this, the Prophet, peace be upon him, asked Ubaidah bin al-Harith Hamza, his uncle and his cousin Ali, to go forward for the combat. The three duels were rapid. Hamza killed Shaiba. Oh, so when they say like three duels, was it like one on one? Ah, uh, while Ali killed Al Walid, Ubaida was seriously wounded. But before he fell, Hamza fell upon Utba, and with a sweep of his sword, cut off his head. <laughs> Fring! Ali and Hamza carried Ubaida back with his leg cut off. Ooh, dang! He died four or five days later of a disease in the bile duct. Oh, dang. That must have been painful. Ali used to swear that Allah's words were revealed about them. These two opponents, believers and disbelievers, dispute each other about their Lord. 22.19 The duel was followed by a few more duels, but the Meccan suffered terrible defeats in all the combats. Uh, and lost some of their most precious lives. They were too much frustrated and angry and fell upon the Muslims to destroy them once and for all. The Muslims, however, after supplicating their Lord, calling upon him and conduct a defensive war plan that was successful enough to inflict heavy losses on the attackers. The Prophet, peace be with him, used to pray to his Lord persistently day and night to come to their help. When the fierce engagement grew too hot, he again began to supplicate his Lord, saying, O oh Allah, should this group of Muslims be defeated today, you will no longer be worshipped. Oh. He continued to call out to his Lord, stretching forth his hands and facing Al-Qibla, until his cloak fell off his shoulders. 
Then Abu Bakr came, picked up the cloak, and put it back on his shoulders and said, O Prophet of Allah, you have cried out enough to your Lord. He will surely fulfill what he has promised you. Immediate was the response from Allah who sent down angels from the heavens for the help and assistance of the Prophet and his companions. The noble Quran observes, Verily I am with you, so keep firm those who have believed. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who have disbelieved. 8.12 Allah the Almighty also inspired another message to his messenger, saying, I will help you with a thousand of the angels, each behind the other, following one another in succession. 8-9 Okay, this says, The Descent of the Angels. The Prophet, peace be upon him, in his trellis, dozed off a little, and then raised his head, calling loudly, Abu Bakr, glad tidings are there for you. Allah's victory has approached. By Allah, I can see Jibril on his mare in the thick of a sandstorm. <laughs> he then came swiftly upon the ground, reciting aloud. Their multitude will be put to flight, and they will show their backs. Wow. Very interesting. At the instance of Jibril, the prophet took a handful of gravel, cast it at the enemy, and said, Confuse, seize their faces. As he flung the dust, a violent sandstorm blew into the eyes of the enemies. With respect to this, Allah says, And you, i.e. Muhammad, threw not when you did throw, but Allah threw. <gasps> oh, I get it now. Okay, yeah. That's very interesting. We learn our oh, oh, yes. Wow. So again, the dueling. Oh man, that one must have been cool. Hard, but very cool, right? Imagine it says they took the guy took off the dude's head. To have that the blade, how sharp it has to be, and the force you need, and the focus and precision. It's crazy. All right, family, I got to go eat dinner now. Uh, but uh, we'll read again tomorrow. Thank you for watching. Hoping you're having a good quarantine. Oh, man, we're getting into the battle zone, but I'm so hungry now. And my stomach's growling, and I can smell that dinner's ready. So I'll see you all later, okay? Take care now.